Good afternoon and good morning to those joining us out west. I'm Karen Langdon with the National Emergency Management Association, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, COVID-19 Vaccine Logistics, Understanding the Distribution, Storage, and Regulatory Requirements of Maintaining a Successful Medical Stockpile. Again, thank you for being with us today, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Mike Sprayberry. Mike is the Director of North Carolina Emergency Management and an esteemed former president of NEMA. Mike, over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. And I think you can see on your screens there, um, or if you don't have a screen, we do have a, a very distinguished group of panelists. First, we have Dr. Betsy Tilson, uh, the State Health Director and Chief Medical Officer for the State of North Carolina and the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. We also have Steve Solomon, the Vice Chairman of Life Science Logistics, and Richard Beeney, the CEO of Life Science Logistics. We have a very, very important topic here today, um, understanding how we distribute storage and, and the requirements of maintaining a successful medical stockpile in the middle of a pandemic. This is a topic that we're all interested in, no matter what discipline you are. So let's get started. Dr. Tilson has a limited time of being with us. Uh, she's very busy, as you might imagine. She's on point for vaccines in the state of North Carolina. But <clears throat> just let me tell you, as, as the North Carolina Emergency Management uh, Director, and she's our state health director, she is my esteemed battle buddy. And not only is uh, Dr. Tilson um, a medical doctor, of course, graduated from uh, Johns Hopkins, that's where she got her MD, uh, her degree in biology from Dartmouth. You'll see all that in her bio. I think we can also say that she's an operator. She's got a lot of experience uh, at all different levels uh, in the field. And so in her leadership now, I think that role now, I think that really serves her well. And so she's a great partner. Um, she's doing a great job for us and uh, leading us uh, you know, through all these different, uh, the different challenges of this pandemic. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn, turn her over to you so that she can provide a presentation and answer some of your questions. Dr. Tilson, you have the floor, ma'am. Thank you, Director Sprayberry, and it is an honor to serve with you and to be uh, your battle buddy. There is nobody I would rather be on the front lines with than you, so thank you for that. Um, as uh, Director Sprayberry said, I do serve as a state health director and the chief medical officer, um, and so I'm going to be a little bit more heavy on some of the um, some of the clinical, some of the science pieces. So you're routed in that, and then I know my colleagues are also uh, will be a little bit more heavy on some of the logistics um, and some of the stories. So hopefully you will get a balanced uh, picture of our of the the picture of the vaccine. So the first thing I wanted just to be sure that people are routed in how this vaccine was actually developed, because what we hear a lot across all of our fields, including our emergency management folks, is a concern that this vaccine, we have gotten it so quickly, and so does that mean that there was corners cut in terms of safety? Do I need to worry about this vaccine because it was sped through? And so I, I wanted to spend a minute or two on grounding you on the processes that are part of Operation Warp Speed, which you've probably heard as the title of the federal government's program for this. And the first thing I want to say is that yes, this vaccine has come to production more quickly than usual, but it's not because of cutting corners of safety and efficacy. And it's one, because we had a head start with some of the science that I'll talk about, but also there were really good policy and planning and logistic decisions that were made to be able to get the vaccine out as quickly as possible. So I just want to highlight a couple of those key policy decision making um, decisions that were made. The first thing is that we had a head start on the science. I'll talk a little bit about the science within this vaccine, which is called messenger RNA. But we had a head start on that, and this messenger RNA technology had been developed in the past couple of years for other coronaviruses. So we had a head start on the science that then we could apply to this particular virus as soon as we had the genetic code of this virus, which we learned back in December. So that's the first thing. Second thing is a key policy decision was that instead of waiting for the clinical trials to be done to start producing vaccine, production of vaccine started at the same time as the clinical trials. So which whatever clinical trials were successful in terms of safety and efficacy, we would already have 
a stockpile of vaccine to go. It won't be, it wouldn't be enough in, um, for everybody right at the beginning, but we would already have some to go and there would not be any wait between when the science told us it was okay and we could actually use it. And so you can see that's represented in the parallel lines um, that that manufacturing started at the same time as the clinical trials. That was a key decision. And the, finan the, the federal government did that financial backing of starting to fund the, the production of the vaccine even if it wasn't sure that it would be found to be safe and effective. So that was key. Third piece is on that top line, uh, if we walk through the clinical trials, there were a couple design and policy decisions made that helped to speed up the, that science. The first piece is that the, the same cadence of phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials that was all followed with this, these vaccines, just like all vaccines. But a couple things, decisions were made to speed that up. One, as soon as the phase one clinical trials were starting, they were already planning and organizing phase three clinical trials. So that if the phase one and phase two were, were found to be successful, there would be no gap between the different phases. So we we're able to move through those phases quickly because there was no gap between them. Third, or what I'm up to now, four, I guess, in the phase three clinical trials, that is the part where you enroll more people so that you can get a better idea of safety and efficacy. Typically, uh, about 3,000 to 4,000 people are enrolled in a clinical trial. In these, we had 10 times as, as high as enrollment, 30,000 for Moderna, 45,000 for Pfizer, so 10 times as many people enrolled in the clinical trials, which then allowed us to be able to get that safety and efficacy data more quickly because we had so many people in the clinical trials. And then finally, in terms of the, the data review, the science review, the authorization, all of the, the same processes were in place. FDA has an external advisory board. The CDC has an external advisory board, science board, where they look at all that data. All those processes and reviews were done, but the scheduling was efficient such that the FDA advisory board for the FDA met, and then the very next day, the CDC advisory board met. So the they were scheduled back to back to back to make that review and authorization more quickly. So those are some of the key components is how is it we've been able to do this more quickly, not because there were cuts um, in the science or the data and the efficacy. And I just think that's a really important piece for you to understand and be able to articulate to um, your stakeholders, because that's what we hear from the field. The biggest concern is how can it be safe if it happens so quickly? Wonderful, I'm just gonna take you just a little bit into some of the data around the Pfizer vaccine. This was the one that was um, authorized by the FDA on Friday and then recommended by the CDC's group, which is the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice that recommended that on Saturday. And this is the one that we started vaccinating on Monday with. So just a little bit um, about this vaccine so you know some of the science and data behind it. One, diluted to uh, this one, 43,000 people were in the phase three clinical trial. Um, they had 42% uh, of people were in diverse backgrounds, and you can see that breakdown on the right. Still, there was not a proportional representation of African Americans in the trial, um, but it, there was a, at least 10% of African Americans um, in those trials, and you can see those of Hispanic and Latinx population, about 26% representation. And they had almost half the people had significant underlying chronic conditions that would put you at risk for COVID, so things like cancer and heart disease. Um, so they had a fairly good representation um, in these clinical trials. What they found was that the vaccine was 95% effective in preventing illness and severe illness um, seven days after that second dose. And that effectiveness, when they looked at based on your age, based on demographics, based on our underlying health conditions, found that to be very, very consistent. So protective really of everybody, regardless of the, the differences of people in those clinical trials, um, which is great. Um, this is, I, I went through the time frame of the authorization. This is the one that I'm sure you have heard that requires the ultra cold storage at negative 75 degrees, which makes some of that shipping and handing and storage a little bit, um, uh, tricky. Uh, we do have facilities and uh, all states have facilities with that permanent ultra cold storage. However, one of the design decisions was that this vaccine would be shipped in a shipping container that if you refilled it with dry ice every five days, you could actually keep it in that shipping container um, up to 30 days. And then if you take it out of that shipping container and out of the dry ice, uh, ice another five days at refrigerated temperature. So it is sensitive. You do need that ultra cold temperature, but you can do that without a permanent storage with replenishment of that dry ice every five days. 
This one does require a two dose and, and as does the Moderna, which is coming down the pike, which will make a little bit of a logistical challenge because we need to be sure everybody comes back for the second dose at the right time, which is about 17 to 21 days after that first dose. We get this question a lot. What if people don't come back? How effective is just one dose? And obviously the vast, vast majority of people in the clinical trial got two doses. So we do not have sufficient data broad of how much protection after one dose. We think that there is some protection after that first dose, um, but we don't have enough data to really be clear on exactly how much protection and how long that would last after that first dose. So we really wanna be sure people are getting in on the second dose. A little bit about what is actually in this vaccine. We get this question all the time, and I think the science behind this was brilliant. It is what we call an mRNA or messenger RNA, and what it is is it's a teeny little snippet of the genes of the virus, a tiny little piece that codes for one of the proteins in the virus. And what the, the vaccine is a teeny piece of this genetic material in a, uh, a lipid envelope, meaning there's uh, four different kind of fats in a little envelope and the genetic material is in this little ball of fat. Um, and then with a little bit of salt and sugar. And that's it, that's, that's what's in the vaccine. And what happens is with that vaccine, then that tiny little piece of genetic material is incorporated into some of our cells. It tells our cells to produce one little piece of the protein, so not the full virus, but one little piece of the protein of the virus. And then that triggers our immune response to make antibodies for that protein. So that if we see the actual virus that has that protein on it, our bodies already recognize, oh, I know that protein isn't a good protein. And then those antibodies can then jump in right away um, and fight off that virus. It really is, I think, incredibly elegant. Um, but there is no full virus, no live virus. It's just a teeny piece of the genetic material that codes for only one protein. Um, and that's enough to trigger that protective immune response. It's pretty quite amazing. Um, in the clinical trials, across all of the people enrolled that were in the clinical trials didn't identify any serious safety concerns. We do expect, and people should, should expect and be counseled to have some temporary re reactions to the vaccine. Much like if you've had a shingles vaccine, you feel pretty lousy two days later, or a tetanus shot, you feel really lousy two days later. So people should expect to have some soreness, um, some fatigue, headache, not feeling great about a day or two after the vaccine, but that lasts about a day or two um, and, then, um, and then better. But that is an important piece. The other piece that we are learning now that we are doing mass vaccinations in populations, and you've probably heard this in the UK, um, that uh, three out of the first 15,000 people that got the vaccine had um, a severe allergy reaction to that. Um, and what it is looking like it is maybe that one of those little lipids, I was talking about the fats that is in the envelope, specifically what we call polyethylene glycol, that people who have allergies to that one lipid um, shouldn't take this vaccine. Um, but otherwise, that's the, that's the only thing that we have been seeing so far um, post-clinical trial. And the other recommendation is that, and we get this question a lot, that yes, if you've already had the, the infection, you still should get the vaccine. People in the clinical trials who had the infection were enrolled in the clinical trials without a problem, and, and we don't know how long your natural immunity from the infection will take, so that is the recommendation. And just very, very high level, hot on the heels Moderna, um, the same mRNA technology, and pretty much in the clinical trials, the same results, so that 95% effectiveness, no serious safety concerns. I think since it's the same technology, the fact that we are getting very similar results from both of these massive trials, 30,000 in Moderna, 45,000 in Pfizer, very consistent results, gives me even more confidence um, on this technology. This is the one that will the FDA is gonna review that science tomorrow. Um, and then we'll most likely go to the CDC review committee on the weekend, and hopefully we will have that authorization and recommend recommendation this weekend because we are slated to receive Moderna doses starting next week, and that will be our next wave of uh, vaccination. Wonderful. We get a lot of questions um, about will people have to pay for this? How will the reimbursement work? What about the money? Um, and so I just um, included this slide um, to, to do two different points. One, that there, sh there will be no cost to anybody who receives the, the vaccine. That is a federal requirement, um, but nobody will be charged for the vaccine. The actual vaccine has been funded and, and paid for by the federal government. Um, and then there is what's called an administration fee. So the cost for providers to actually administer the fee, administer the vaccine 
all of those administrative costs will be covered by our commercial insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, and for people who are uninsured, there'll be a way that our providers will be able to um, uh, get reimbursement through a provider relief fund. Um, so our providers will have the resources they need to actually administer the vaccine, and the vaccine um, itself will be paid for by the federal government. So that comes up a lot um, in terms of costs. So I just want to make sure that was out there um, and you knew that um, there will be no charge for people um, to receive the vaccine. All right, so those are some of what's going on at the federal level. And then I'm just going to bring you down to the, the North Carolina version of this, how we're thinking about operationalizing, planning and operationalizing this. The first piece is that with our whole response to COVID and now um, moving over to our vaccine response, we've tried to be very mindful to have a lens of equity from the, from the front end. We know that our historically marginalized population or communities of color have been hit harder with COVID um, throughout this whole pandemic. And we want to be sure that we are having this equitable access to vaccine, especially for our historically marginalized population and communities of color who are bearing the burden of this disease more than other populations. Um, so you'll see that some of our guiding, uh, these are our guiding principles. We want to have that lens of equity. We want to be sure we're very inclusive in planning um, with our, our local and, um, and other state partners, with our private communities, and especially with our leaders in our historically marginalized population. Um, so we can get it as right as we as we can on the front end. We're trying to be as transparent as possible. Information and plans and logistics are changing literally by the hour. So we are trying to just continue to have that frequent um, update of communication so people know what we know. We uh, will be um, tracking our data on, on, um, on the immunization, on uh, how much we're getting, how much we're pushing out, who is getting vaccinated. And we will be collecting that data, and we will also be um, putting up a, a public dashboard of, of course, de uh, you know, anonymous data or de-identified data, so that we're sure people can track along with us as well. That transparency then is conveying that public trust um, as we are moving along. And then finally, we know and we continue to live every day that every hour things are changing. And so we've really embraced a concept of agile design or continuous quality improvement that, um, you know, today we were better than we were yesterday and tomorrow will be better than we are today um, as we go through this process of um, rapidly changing information. A really important piece of our planning and now an exceedingly important piece and sometimes challenging piece of our operations is our prioritization. We, we anticipated, even though we have some vaccine right away, right after um, authorization, as I alluded to, we, we knew we would not have enough for everybody and there'd be very, very limited supplies in the beginning. And so we uh, went through uh, we, a thoughtful process on prioritization. All states did the federal government as well, but knowing it's very important when you have limited supply, what is your prioritization, what's your base of prioritization, and making sure that we're transparent with that. So what we have done is we have adopted a risk-based prior prioritization strategy. We grounded it in the National Academy of Medicine in the principles of equitable vaccine distribution. Um, and then we had informed our external advisory boards um, on fine-tuning that. Um, and we are then prioritizing first those healthcare workers with the highest risk of exposure, um, and our people in nursing homes, our long-term care homes, um, and then next people at the highest risk of severe illness with um, with COVID-19, and especially those at high risk of exposure, and then then moving down the line of people who are at that high risk of the, of, of exposure but lower risk of complication as we move forward. Just a little bit, and you probably are familiar with this, but just a little bit of the, how the vaccine um, is, is moving its way. This is unlike with PPE, where the state ordered and stored the PPE, and then we're responsible for distributing it. That is not the case um, with this vaccine. Um, what, how it works, or the federal government tells us how much vaccine we're going to get. We have been enrolling providers. Um, once we know how much we're going to get, we allocate that and know where we want it to send to different providers. We tell the federal government where we want that vaccine sent, um, and then that is sent either directly from the manufacturer or through McKesson directly to the provider. And then you can see on those orange dots that then our providers then are the ones who are setting up the mass vaccination clinics and doing all of that data um, uh, recording um, and administrative work that we need them to do. And just a little bit of our uh, how we were trying to operationalize some of that uh, priority um, lens and that lens of equity. 
the first group of providers we uh, enrolled were our hospitals and our local health departments. Then we moved to providers that we knew would get to um, our most um, vulnerable populations, so our people in our migrant farm camps, in our homeless shelters, um, um, in our more congregate settings, and so pulled in our safety nets uh, providers, our federally qualified health centers, our rural health centers. We also are participating in the federal program through Walgreens and CVS, um, the, the long-term care program to get at our nursing homes, so those very, very high-risk critical populations. Then we'll be moving and bringing in our, our providers that can serve our incarcerated population, our occupational health folks who can help with those critical infrastructure frontline workers. And then, then as we move through, we're opening up to our broad range of providers, our outpatient providers, our more retail providers, um, that we can get more broad-based to the communities. But we've tried to operationalize our provider enrollment based on that prioritization strategy of our populations most at risk. Um, just a little bit, this is uh, the long-term care uh, pharmacy program. I think this was a great program the federal government put up was how can we be sure that with federal support we can get to the majority of our nursing homes, to those long care facilities where we know we have so much disease and spread and death, highest risk of death um, or highest number of death of people in, in nursing homes. Um, so uh, our 100% of our skilled nursing facilities in North Carolina opted into this federal program and 85% um, of our, our adult care homes and the federal government then is, is helping us work through that with CVS and Walgreens, which has been great. Um, so they helped to run that program, but the, the allocation comes from North Carolina's bank. So what you'll see is that we turned the program on last week. Um, next week, if Moderna is authorized, then the, the allocation that we get from Moderna, we cull some of that and we basically give it back to the federal government to say this is the amount that, um, that we're allocating to you to turn to use for long-term care. Um, and then if that authorization comes forward, then uh, through this federal program, we will start vaccinating in our nursing homes on 1228 with North Carolina's allocation, but all of the logistics are handled through the federal government. We just had to tell them when to turn it on and then when to start drawing from our allocations. So that was a very lovely, I think, program the federal government did. Um, just a little bit into the insight of North Carolina's numbers. Uh, again, week one, this is where we are right now. We are day three of week one. So we had about 88,000 uh, doses of our Pfizer. Um, because of the large, they come in 90, 975 um, units, we could only at the most sp spread it out to 88 different sites. We looked at um, population density, people's ability to handle it, to be able to uh, use 975 doses in a pretty quick period. Um, and so with all that, we um, for what week one, they'll be going out to 53 different hospitals um, based on, you can see how some of the, the basis for our prioritization. And then week two, starting tomorrow, uh, next week, assuming Moderna gets authorized, um, then uh, we will be shipping more Pfizer to our hospitals and to our local health departments, some of our big health departments that can manage that ultra cold chain. Um, and then this is the Moderna, we'll be culling that to go to our long-term care and then starting to push Moderna, which um, can be just in 100, um, intricates of 100. Those will be going to some of our smaller rural hospitals that couldn't handle the bigger Pfizer um, and to our health departments. And as we get more and more, then we'll be able to be pushing more of this out um, into um, our other communities providers um, as we go week to week. And this just gives you an idea of kind of what we think over the next week will be um, as we're pushing out to our hospitals. And then as you can see, the more we get, the more we'll be pushing out into our community providers. One thing to note is that what the federal government told us that the of the so the 85,000 we get for dose one, they're holding back dose two, and we should be getting then a shipment of dose two so we can be sure that everybody who got dose one, there'll be sufficient supply to get dose two. One challenge that we did in North Carolina was our current immunization registry was not sufficient for the data um, that we needed and the functionality we needed. And so in about a six week process, we built our own, uh, this is our COVID vaccine management system um, and we, we built it on and it went live just a, about a week ago. Um, and so we will be iterating from our minimal viable product to versions that have more and more functionality. Um, but this is the system that we will that we are using um, and that we are uh, rolling out. Um, and this is a system from which we'll get the data that we will be able to put into our public facing dashboard to show who's getting vaccinated, where are our gaps, are there communities that um, we don't have access um, that we can use this data for, again, public transparency and also for internal um, planning. This has been quite a feat trying to put up a whole IT system in, in six weeks, but 
it is live and it is working um, and we will make it better as we go forward. And then finally, these are my last slides. Communication is key. Um, it's been really, really, really important from the start um, to think how do we provide early transparent communication? How do we make sure people trust the information that they understand the benefits and risks and they can make that informed decision for themselves? Um, those have been some of the tenants. What we're learning, and I'm sure you're hearing that, is across the nation, higher vaccine hesitancy amongst our historically marginalized population, our communities of color. Um, women actually higher vaccine hesitancy than women and folks with um, lower um, socioeconomic um, um, status and levels. So we're thinking through that um, and how is it that we can reach those populations and make sure that they have what they need um, to feel comfortable and to feel safe. So we have a, uh, some of our really key decisions are one, as I've articulated to you, this idea that the, of the process, how is it that although the process was fast, that still was um, good data in terms of safe and safety and efficacy, this expectation that though we have vaccine, it's very little. Um, and so making sure people that expectation setting, we don't have enough for everybody. And then again, this intentionality of trying to be inclusive in our planning. And then we have all sorts of tools that are publicly available. You're happy to, for you to click on our website and get as many tools um, as a way we're trying to push out our, our, a lot of our um, talking points and our messages so that people have as much information um, as we can get to them. And this is um, some other examples of that. We did some great PSAs with people actually in nursing homes. Many of our nursing home staff are communities of, uh, from communities of color, and so we wanted to be sure um, that people were hearing from people that looked like them on, on how, what they're thinking about receiving um, the vaccine. So we have lots of great tools that you are more than willing to click and take and adapt and, and utilize. We're happy to share. I went over just a little bit. I apologize, um, but I am happy to um, uh, take questions um, for a couple minutes, and then um, I will have to drop to another uh, committee. Thank, thanks, Dr. Tilson. And you do have a number of questions uh, leading off with, um, can people with latex allergies take the vaccine? Yes, sir. The only absolute contraindication is a known anaphylaxis or allergy to the ingredients in the vaccine. And again, the ingredients of the vaccine is a little bit of the virus, the, 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 the virus gene, and then those four lipids uh, or four kind of fats. So again, the, the polyethylene glycol seems to be the one that may be triggering the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, allergy. So if you have allergies to any of those, then no. Second, there is a warning that if you've had any severe allergies to um, an injectable or another vaccine, so an injectable medicine or another vaccine, then there is a warning that we, we might want to think about it. But all other allergies, so food allergies, latex allergies, snake venom, I got that question last night, no of those other uh, allergies are considered a contraindication to this vaccine. How long will the vaccine immunity last? We don't know that. Right now, we know that uh, at least two months after the second dose, but uh, people in the clinical trials will be followed for the next two years. And as part of that, there will be assessment of those antibodies. So we'll have more information as we go forward of how long the immunity will last. I hope from a planning perspective, as <laughs> really long, because it's going to be hard to be able to do this mass vaccination <laughs> campaign every six months. So we'll learn that as we go forward. Um, and, and again, Thank those you. will be followed for the next two years. Was the 95% effectiveness rate consistent for all age groups? Yes, sir. All age groups, all demographics, and all those with different underlying comorbidities was very consistent across all the groups. What's the difference between vaccines requiring such severe differences in the cold storage requirements? Yeah, then, you know, that's a really great question that I, I to be honest, I don't know the answer because both the Moderna and the Pfizer are both the mRNA technology. So I'm not quite sure why the Pfizer one is so much more sensitive than the Moderna one. I, I don't know that answer. I'll be transparent about Thank that. Thank you, ma'am. Will welcome. distribution sites be able to request vaccines based upon their ability to store them properly? Well, as part of the provider enrollment process, part of that provider enrollment is that the providers tell us what is your storage capacity? What do you have? Can you do you, you know do you have on-site ultra cold storage or if not, what, do you have the freezer for the Moderna? They tell us what their storage capacity is, and they also tell us what's their throughput capacity. So depending on that, that helps us to say, oh, okay, you'll be an easier one to send the Pfizer, or you might be one better for the Moderna. So part of that provider enrollment, they tell us what they can do, and then that helps us figure out how much you should get and what vaccine you should get. 
And I think that's what we're doing in North Carolina with our rural areas. They're prioritized for Moderna because they don't have those severe cold storage requirements. Is that right? Well, not just that, because some of it is those places that had permanent ultra cold storage. That was easy. But a lot of right. people, that was those first 11 early ship sites. But the, the 43 other hospitals, they did not have permanent ultra cold storage. So it goes in that shipping container and then they can replenish it with the dry ice. But they have to have enough people that they can kind of get through at least 975 immunizations within a couple of weeks. Our rural hospitals told us like, ooh, um, even if we, you know, we can store in the shipping containers, but it's going to be really hard for us to get that many people through um, in that short a period of time. So it was more the number of people that can get through than needing that permanent um, cold storage. That's what our rural hospitals told us was that that's just too much vaccine for us to get through that quickly. So that's more, it's more the number of people than the storage. Okay. And then uh, have we gotten the, the active duty military forces and the vaccination priorities yet? Well, the active duty is really coming through the, the Department of Defense. I know that one of our bases, Fort Bragg, I believe, I know that they are, um, they will be one of the first sites that comes through the DOD. So active duty uh, military, that is that program is coming through the DOD, not through the states. Okay. And, but, veterans, um, we, but veterans come through the, the, the states. Right. As more vaccines are made available, what happens if different levels of efficacy or different results? For example, one presents SARS-CoV-2, one present, presents uh, COVID-19, and, and people then decide they want one over the other. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is that the name of the virus is that clunky, weird name, SARS-CoV-2. It is severe acute respiratory syndrome co uh, coronavirus. So that is the actual name of the virus. It is such a clunky virus, a name, that instead what we, the COVID-19 is actually um, the, the coronavirus infectious disease 2019. COVID-19 is the disease you get from the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It is clunky, it is not great, but they are the same thing. COVID-19 is a disease you get from the virus. So all these vaccines are, are at that virus um, to, to prevent that virus from infecting you and preventing you from getting COVID-19. So it's, it's all the same thing, even though COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 um, confuses people. So, uh, right, we're going to have potentially several different vaccines coming down the pike, which is good. We'll have more vaccine, but um, it'll be a little bit logistically complex because especially the two-dose vaccines, we want to be sure that people, if you start with, for example, Pfizer, you have your second dose with Pfizer. Start with Moderna, second dose with Moderna. You can't um, exchange between those different vaccines. So people will um, have to uh, know, um, you know, right now Pfizer and Moderna look very, very similar, pretty equal. I don't think it really matters. If vaccines come down the pike that maybe have less effectiveness or maybe more um, side effects, then people would need to understand that um, and then make that decision of which one they would want to get. Could you clarify or elaborate on patient consents for residents in nursing homes or um, assisted living? Yep, happy to. So a couple things in there, and then I do apologize, I'm gonna have to uh, drop right on okay. One thing is that we get this question a lot. People who were enrolled in the clinical trials, it was an investigation, experimental, um, uh, those clinical trials. So people that were enrolled in the clinical trials needed to sign written informed consent specifically to be part of an investigation process. Now that the, the data has been looked at and has been authorized, you don't need that same level of consent to be part of an investigation or, or, um, or developmental process because now it is, is authorized. Um, so there's definitely level of consent. But we also want to be sure there is any, anybody getting the vaccine or any providers giving the vaccine, they must give patients um, a, uh, a sheet that talks about all the pros and cons and must counsel them that they can either choose to accept the vaccine or not accept the vaccine. Um, and then they must consent to get the vaccine. It doesn't need to be a written consent, but they must consent to get the vaccine. What I have seen with CVS and Walgreens is that they actually are going to have them do a written consent um, and, um, and provide that for the, for the long-term care residents as an added um, safety, safety measure or added um, empowerment for those residents. Dr. Tilson, we certainly appreciate your 
a willingness to come on uh, this webinar and share your expertise in this most important topic. And a personal uh, thank you for your your willingness to do it and and your willingness to answer some of these tough questions. And thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Great, thank you. I appreciate you as well. Thank you, ma'am. Next up, we have Steve Solomon, the Vice Chairman of LSL Logistics. He's a seasoned cybersecurity expert, a tech executive, and an entrepreneur focusing on areas of supply chain logistics and infrastructure. He's got a lot of great experience as well. He's uh, testified before Congress on cyber legislation and on the importance of protecting our national infrastructure. His bio is, is uh, online here, just like uh, Mr. Beanie and Dr. Tilson's. So Mr. Solomon, you have the floor. Thank you, Director Sprayberry. We appreciate it and we look forward to um, trying to help people um, navigate through this process as well. Um, so I'm going to provide a little information. We're going to, well, first, we're going to discuss the COVID vaccine, the storage and expectations, logistically what's required on the field. Um, the current stockpile in the state level, what do they look like today? And pretty much what everyone learned, lessons learned during the COVID um, stockpile distribution and process. And we can talk about what stockpile should look like in the future and what's coming down the uh, roadmap as far as the federal side and requirements and state levels. And a very important topic, we don't want to be in this situation again and talk about how we rotate our, techno our stockpiles, maintain them as an evergreen solution instead of expiring, um, that we found out quite a bit happened during this time. And what's happening legislatively as far as requirements or potential funding that will assist states moving down the, down the um, future down here. So, just a quick overview. We've been doing it for 15 years, um, life science. We, we manage the, on the federal stockpile side from the national side, and we're quite active on the state's stockpile side right now as well. So we've been through H1N1, Ebola, Zika, COVID-19, and we continue to do that. So we manage the process, understanding logistics requirements, the facility requirements, and how do you do countermeasures and be ready for critical missions. Everybody in the field and everybody on this phone today has done heroic work and a lot of tools weren't available during this process. And we, um, as we cross the country dealing with many states, understanding the requirements and needs, we're gonna kind of put together some requirements and needs, understanding how they get better prepared for the future and help them get through this, the tough times here and hopefully never again in the future we learn lessons here. And I'm gonna have Rich Beanie jump in now, discuss some of the vaccines and as far as requirements of storage and just distribution. Okay, thanks, Steve. I'd also like to echo, echo the sentiment that, you know, we've, we've been in front of probably, I don't know, 35 different states around the country over the last however many months. And, uh, and to Steve's point, it's really, um, it's really heartening to see the amazing work that is going out in the field. So I just want to, you know, take my hat off to to all of you guys. You're on the pointy end of the spear, but you, you're doing amazing work and it, and it makes a difference. You know, Dr. Tilson did a good job of kind of covering a, a little bit of what we're going to go through here. But at a high level, operational warp speed is basically, you know, the process by which we, we got these vaccines to market. And the two that we're really talking about today are Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine. And they have slightly different supply chains. So the, the Pfizer supply chain is really one where they, you know, in addition to creating the vaccine, they also created uh, an ancillary kit that is getting delivered with the vaccine, and they created a cold storage shipper, um, I think primarily because they, they recognize the challenges around, you know, transporting and storing a vaccine that requires minus 75C storage. So they actually did quite a good job of creating the shipper, and we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. Um, and so that supply chain is really one where it goes, you know, from Pfizer uh, through the through the Defense Logistics Agency and then out to delivery points. The Moderna vaccine is is slightly different, um, and so they, in addition to creating the vaccine, you know, it's got a lower uh, or a higher temperature storage requirement. And there we're actually working with with McKesson, who is creating their ancillary kits. Uh, that are going to be distributed by McKesson uh, on behalf of, of Moderna and then out 
out to the field, if you like. But uh, but two very similar products, two slightly different supply chains. But that's kind of what it looks like uh, at a high level. So just to touch on the on the various vaccines that are out there. So the AstraZeneca vaccine not approved yet. Um, you know, an efficacy range uh, not unlike Moderna and Pfizer. Um, it is a two to eight storage, so it's, uh, you know, you can store this vaccine in a refrigerated environment. Both Moderna and Pfizer, as we've already talked about, both frozen, uh, frozen storage requirements. Moderna, again, minus 20C, which is a slightly easier uh, storage condition to maintain, and the, and the Pfizer minus 70, which, uh, which is the more challenging version of it. But again, they've, they've worked hard to kind of uh, ameliorate the risk around how to handle that vaccine. Yeah, so right now, I mean, again, Dr. Tilson did a, did a good job of, of talking about how this, how this distribution process uh, is gonna work. Um, but again, the vaccine and ancillary kits shipped to, to you know, clinics and hospitals and long-term care facilities, uh, and then later on in large immunization um, sites. Um, again, I have a picture on the next slide of what the of, of what the ancillary kits look like. But to the right, you see a picture of the sorry. To the right, you see a picture of the Pfizer shipper, um, and you can store this stuff relatively long term. And what I mean by that is 30 days, uh, provided that you're re-icing every five days. The challenge here is is um, you know kind of getting our hands on all of this dry ice. So it takes 50 pounds of dry ice to re-ice this thing, and you can really only do it um, you know, for 30 days uh, at a clip before it really needs to be in a, in a stand-up freezer um, for long-term storage. So here's a picture of the McKesson kind of ancillary kit, and you can see what's in there. So there's, you know, there's needles and syringes and alcohol prep pads and, and diluent and a little bit of PPE. So pretty much everything that you would really need to administer the vaccine all in a kit uh, created by McKesson that will, that will ship out with the, uh, with the Moderna vaccine through that network. And then to the right there is just a picture of somebody icing the Pfizer coolers. You can kind of see the size of them. Uh, and again, 50 pounds of dry ice um, is, is a lot of dry ice. And then you run into you know, safety issues around handling it and, and the sublimation of dry ice and CO2 monitoring and, and some of the complexities around, uh, around the storage and handling of dry ice, especially in, a, in an enclosed environment. So certainly something that, that folks need to be aware of out there. So we want to talk, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about state stockpiles, right? So most of the folks um, on this call have been living and breathing this uh, probably since around the you know late January, early February time frame. Uh, we too have been living and breathing it, as you can imagine, as part of our response for the for the federal stockpile. But then also, you know, we've traveled around the country. Um, we've visited, you know, probably oh I don't know, 40 or 50 different state stockpile locations. Um, and everybody has a similar story to tell, right? And I think the overarching theme here is, you know what, stockpiles are hard to build in the middle of a, in the middle of a global pandemic. So, you know, we don't need to talk about the federal stockpile and, and how it really wasn't built for this sort of mission. It was always intended to be the backstop. And there was always a sense that, you know, you wouldn't have global disruption of the supply chain in terms of PPE availability. And you know, there's already discussions going on around where that stuff should be manufactured and is it a national security concern? And, and that's really not for this conversation, but, but those conversations are being had. But everybody experienced the same thing and everybody to some degree or other has built up in the last however many months their own state stockpile. There were a few states that actually, uh, that actually had a, a stockpile, and it wasn't just the leftovers from H1N1 back in 2009. And so hats off to those folks, but most, most states really were relying on the federal government to do this. 
And what does that physical infrastructure look like today? Well, they're standing up distribution centers in, in their already existing RSS sites, which were you know, typically too small and, and not really designed to handle the kind of volume of PPE that's demanded in this situation. States went out and leased warehouses. Um, you know, most of the states have partnered with the National Guard to, to one degree or another, and we're storing, you know, product in armories. Um, lots of states are, are storing stuff in, in leased trailers. Um, folks are using convention centers and parking garages and office buildings and conference rooms. And, uh, and we've even seen PPE being stored in liquor stores. Um, yeah. So it's, a, it's really a mixed... It's really a mixed bag out there, and it really is a function of, hey, we need to adapt and overcome, and this is what we have available, and we're going to use it, right? Yeah, and the other part is we want to talk about is the technology. So it was very fragmented, and people are doing everything on Excel spreadsheets. And again, as people were able to cope with it, there were reports that were required on a daily basis. We're not able to be prepared. Yet people, resources driven, working around the clock for weeks, trying to prepare reports for the state legislative or the government agencies or for FEMA requirements to know where the information as far as, the, as far as inventory levels were, what was sent out, what was in the warehouse, what SKUs were available, what was coming down from purchasing. So the lack of communication and fragmented um, technology was not very cohesive with the current technology we build today. So you need a communication plan that, that speaks to multiple agencies at a state level and potentially at the federal level from a global view to understand what's happening in the future. And the other thing we have to really talk about is how you develop this as well as security protocols around this. This is very sensitive information, what's happening. Um, we did notice from, from states, from nursing homes to hospitals, ordering materials, calling in or doing it by emails. And the, the orders will be lost or the SKUs couldn't be met because it was different products they were using. And it was just a big communication problem. So we can learn from the past and say, how do we do this better and establish a better protocol and communication through technology to enable states to move forward and the federal side to move even better for a communication plan, knowing what's happening and when it's happening to the facility itself. Yeah. And somehow through, through, through it all, you know, without, without the proper physical infrastructure and without the proper technology, you know, you all got it done somehow, you know, whether it was on whiteboards or, you know, your big chief tablet or, or Excel, as, as Steve mentioned, um, but the product got out and, and, you know, countless lives were, were saved because of it. But, you know, our point is it doesn't, you know, it didn't need to be this way. And so, you know, we should talk about what it should look like in the future. So this is, this is a concern we had for everything. During this process, there were bad actors. We call them the pop-up pop LLCs. These are individuals or corporations or LLCs that took advantage of the current pandemic and tried to sell product that wasn't good product or counterfeit product or, or other things they did at the facility that hurt a lot of states and hurt a lot of individuals and for safety and for monetary reasons. So we got stuck with a lot of bad product we got stuck with product that never showed up. And so we learned from that and the qualifying side of state agencies to start qualifying as far as purchasing started happening late in the cycle. Um, the quality of materials, again, multiple SKUs, you go in certain facilities, you could have 50 different SKUs of N95 masks. So how do you harmonize those in the future to bring them down to a level you need to be where people are utilizing them? and the availability of durable medical products. We can talk about ventilators. Ventilators, again, were a lot produced. We created a lot more, but now you have a lot of ventilators in the system and we have to figure out how they will be supported in the future. Because a lot of these companies may not maintain them in the future, might not be parts for them. And how, once again, how do we focus on maintaining these on a daily basis? So we went to facilities realizing that there's respirators and different equipment there, but they need to be maintained every month either charged or they need a yearly maintenance on them. So a lot of materials just can't sit in a facility and be ready. The other big thing we noticed was flammable liquids. You can't commingle flammable liquids inside the same facilities just because it has waste and fire department at risk. So 
a lot of things were happening. Again, people did a lot of work to get it, but going forward, these were the problems we see that can be easily corrected and defined through a scope. So on the duration right now, we're looking at a, a staffing level. You know, people were doing a lot of things that were not their day-to-day -day job walking into situations. You had the National Guards essentially coming in and staffing and helping with emergency management, HHS, and Department of Health. And again, they all did a great job, but right now it's scoping it to make the ease of use for developing these centers when they're up and ready for the future. Yeah, the only other thing that I that I would add to that is, you know, nobody really knew what this was gonna look like, right? So at the same time that we're all trying to stand up a stockpile, the mission is really not all that defined, right? How long is this gonna last? What needs to be in the stockpile? How do we maintain, do we maintain the durable medical equipment? How do I staff this thing? and you know, you know what? I've got a day job, right? I had a, I had another role, and that stuff is, you know, it's sort of getting done, but it's not getting done. Um, but the, you know, Steve's point about the National Guard being being essential to this, you can't say enough about the work that those folks are doing. And you know, I would venture to say every state uh, in the country is leveraging the National Guard to one degree uh, or another. We've been working alongside those folks in a number of states, and and they're doing really really amazing work but again it's really unclear how long this thing is going to last right so it's uh you know it's just part of the challenge of how you build a stockpile capability in the middle of a in the middle of a pandemic so so that brings us okay so if that's what it looks like right and and if what it looks like is you know a, a lack of permanent infrastructure whether it's physical infrastructure or technological infrastructure or human infrastructure Right? What should it look like? And this is kind of where you start with the start with the end in mind, right? And so, in, in our work, it's really around how do we define the scope, right? You know, what is the need? What does our stockpile? Uh, what does it need to respond to in terms of a threat matrix? If if those are the threats, what should be the formulary in the stockpile? How quickly does our stockpile need to respond? What should the site look like given those response, uh, those response requirements and, and formulary requirements? Where should our location be? Um, you know, there is an opportunity as we as we set out to build a more permanent solution to this at the state level to you know kind of take a step back and say, okay, what does it really need to look like? How do we design it properly? Where do we place it? What's our procurement strategy? You know, what does transportation need to look like? We've seen, I mean, we've seen everything from Department of Transportation to solid waste folks moving product around, Uber drivers moving product around, National Guard. Um, it's really kind of a mixed bag out there, right? Um, and then once once we figure that out, then there's this, then there's an exercise about building a facility um, and we, you know, we have in here CGMP compliant. And what that really means is the facility that we build to store and manage our medical countermeasures, whether they're PPE or pharmaceuticals or medical devices, really needs to comply with all of the FDA regulations around the storage and management of those products. And there's a, there's a whole set of principles, and we'll get into some of the basics uh, here in a minute, but it's impossible to think about what a future stockpile should look like without giving consideration or proper consideration to the FDA requirements around all of this kind of stuff, right? And once we get into an implementation phase, you know, we do need to have a quality management system in place. We need to hire and train the, the right folks. We need to buy the right stuff, right? And we'll talk about a kind of a rotation uh, program here a little bit later. But procurement is an integral part of setting up a, and managing a proper stockpile. What we've seen um, at the state and federal level is any sort of a disconnect between the procurement folks and the people that are on the floor in the warehouse creates enormous anxiety, right? And so what, what do we mean by that? If we could create an environment where the procurement folks had certain requirements as part of their tenders to go out and buy PPE, like please give us single lot pallets, right? Please build pallet dimensions to, to, to fit into our racking configuration. Please label it 
appropriately. You know, some basic things make the li make the life of the folks that have to deal with this uh, on the ground a whole lot easier. And they get a little bit lost in, tra in, in translation if they're not accounted for uh, on the front end, right? Inventory management practices become super important. You know, Steve talked about biomedical equipment maintenance. Most states out there have a cache of, of ventilators and all of these ventilators require maintenance. Most of them require monthly charging, but a lot of folks aren't aware of that. So, so one thing that I would urge you to do is look in your own stockpiles and kind of try to wrap your arms around at least the charging of the ventilators that you, you have uh, in storage, right? And after this whole thing gets implemented, there's obviously gonna be a, a refinement process, right? There are typically quarterly reviews, We'll talk about product rotation in a minute, but there's a constant evolution and a constant refinement process that needs to take place. We have a whole section uh, around reporting. We talked about the lack of cohesive technology and communication, but this is critical. You know, everybody from the executive branch to procurement to logistics and operations, if they don't get proper reports, and this means like real-time information, what's in inventory, what's headed my way, what already run out, what orders are outstanding, all of those common practices. It's very different, it's very difficult to have, you know, proper command and control if you don't have access to the data that you really need when you need it. So that's kind of the, the process of starting with the end in mind and working backwards to, to develop that stockpile. So let me talk a little bit about some of the kind of basic facility requirements. So lots of folks that we've talked to say, okay, well, that's great. You know, I, I, I have a facility. I understand there's a set of requirements out there. I'm not exactly sure what they are. And rather than waste my time and energy building out a set of infrastructure that doesn't meet the requirements, and then I have to waste additional state resources to redo things, you know, why don't you just tell us what we need from the beginning and make it easy on us? So we put together a couple of a basic slides that talk about that, right? And so we'll look at this in four buckets from a facility perspective, right? All of these facilities need climate control, right? 15 to 30 degrees C is typically what you would find. If we're gonna have refrigerated product and that could be from test kits to vaccine, then you need some sort of, of two to eight refrigerated storage program. Um, you know, minus 20 is a very common uh, freezer capability to have. All of these buildings need not only primary, but secondary temperature and humidity monitoring. Um, backup generators are fairly standard in industry. From a security perspective, you know, everybody is typically afraid that once folks figure out where the good stuff is stored, they're gonna storm the Bastille. And so we need to make sure that we've got proper security uh, infrastructure in place, whether it's access control systems or CCTV or, you know, fencing and all that kind of stuff. Then there's a couple, you know, there's some licensing that needs to take place, right? And, and especially in an FDA environment, uh, they'll, you know, this will need, need to be licensed by the state board of pharmacy. And, and if we get into medical device storage and maintenance, then it requires ISO 13485 certification. If we've got a cage or a vault because we're doing scheduled product, we need to be working with the DEA and the FDA. And then some miscellaneous things to think about, especially from a contingency perspective. Root path diversity is super important, whether it's power or internet. And so most of the facilities that we work in have both of those things. So we've got multiple power sources coming into the building. So if you lose a transformer uh, on one side, you've got another. There's typically a backup generator, as we said, and we typically have multiple uh, bandwidth providers coming into that facility. We are so dependent on data and the internet these days that we really can't afford um, to have that go down. And typically what you'll see in addition to that root path diversity is we're also in storing, storing uh, you know, mobile hotspots and microwave and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, some other basics, you know, pest control and, and housekeeping and all that kind of yep. stuff, it's, it's apparently. One thing I might add in there that a lot of the agencies we're talking to, for example, you can do a shared environment. So with emergency management, for example, on a dealing with HHS, so they might have shared 
facility. The facility might be dedicated to 90% or 80% related to a medical facility um, with a separate controlled area that will be used for emergency management for both supplies, water, cots, and so forth. It allows them to have a mission ready uh, facility there where they can act stage people, stage the facilities, then move out, out the equipment, the non controlled equipment out in the lots at the time, capabilities for cotting and people to sleep and so forth in those facilities and get ready, being it a hurricane, be it earthquake, be it fires and so forth. So you can do a shared environment. One's, a, one's in a controlled environment as far as quality systems and one's in a non-controlled environment related to the cots and beds and waters. Other states we, we have talked to where they wanna do pharmacy involved. Since you're doing a controlled facility, state pharmacy can work in there as well instead of utilizing the space to control their um, distribution out of there for their Department of Health. So there's ways to consolidate a lot of these things and work together since everybody's working on one command together. And you can build these facilities out that each group can work together on those as well. Um, technology is key. Um, we talk about this as information, not just from a warehouse management system, but your quality management systems. And requirements under FDA and 21 CRF, document control, and calibration, you need to have all these things in place. So when we're looking at a first in, first to expire, your rotation program, your track and trace capabilities for reimbursements, everything required under the FDA requirements and the Department of Health, people have to understand that even from PPE, they are medical products and they're being distributed out back to a hospital or another facility. So we have to look at how they're being maintained, how are they stored, what's the record of that, where are they inbound from and track and trace from the origin as well. So it's not just from a controlled center of having a warehouse management solution, what's the quality management system as well? Yeah, the, the only other thing that I wanna add is, is the constant refrain that we get from folks on the warehouse floor, whether they're our own folks or state stockpile folks or, or federal folks is, for the love of God, if you're going to put a new technology in here, please make it easy on me, right? Some of the systems that are currently out there um, are really tough to use. They make the receiving process a challenge. They don't capture all of the data required to actually manage this properly. Um, and because they're not easy to use, people just skip steps, right? And so then when you need to actually use the system or report on the status uh, of the stockpile those data aren't in there you know things like the lots and serialized product all of these ventilators are serialized lots of the other dme is serialized whether it's pulse oximeters or cpaps or or what have you and that information needs to be captured not only for for, for maintenance purposes but also for recall purposes and so this system Yes, it needs to be integrated and it needs to be robust, but it needs to be easy to use or folks just won't do it. And so that's that's been the challenge out there. And so that's why you're seeing people use, you know, Excel and other things because the existing technology is such a challenge that they just flat out don't do it. So, so the, here's an important part. So what we've learned going into this, that a lot of states were still dealing and had leftover product from H1N1 and other products where they were storing stuff in not the right facilities, not controlled, not, you know, we had facilities where people were fogging pesticides in there and products that were stored there. You had rats, you had squirrels, you had mold. So what happened during this time, a lot of products expired and they couldn't use it or wasn't well, it, it wasn't in a position it should be used in a public health or public safety reasons. So what we really focused on now is how do you maintain an evergreen solution in my state or federal side? So there's a way we develop, we can actually do a rotation to keep the product evergreen. Remember this is an asset of the state. Some states have 10 million, some states have close to a billion dollars in product. Every state's gonna vary based on the formulary and product but we need to maintain these and ensure that these products will be here for the future for the next pandemic or risk. And we're not throwing them away when we don't have money to spend. So we developed an internal process and we work with the state, with the state stockpile to work with state hospitals and private sector to allow a rotation program where they can rotate the product out 
at no additional cost to a state level, but work with their partners to allow them to share in the model, share in the state stockpile to ensure an insurance policy for them. So when something, if that balloon goes back up, they have a resource to get their supplies from without having surges and protection as well. So this will allow the states to really to focus on this and it's a real part of the mission going forward. Yeah, that's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a really good point and I just, uh, sorry to make you go back. Um, you know, one of the, one of the primary initial challenges uh, was, you know, we've got all this stuff left over from H1N1, so back in 2009. It's been sitting here, now I finally need it, and I go to use it, and it's just not fit for, it's not, it's not fit for use, right? And so then you fast forward, and to Steve's point, we've spent billions and billions of dollars uh, on this PPE, and if you just pick N95 masks as an example, most folks have somewhere between 20 and 50 different versions of an N95 mask, and all of those masks have some sort of expiration date on them. Some of it's a year from now, some of it's two years from now, some of it's three years from now, and if you're lucky, you've got five years of dating on some of these masks, right? All of that inventory needs to be, the expiry needs to be managed so that you, you know what you should be used and you know what, should, what you should try to rotate out and have it consumed in either the, the public or the, or the private sector, right? There, there is a way to do it. Um, and then eventually we'll, we'll come to this place where the inventory in the state stockpile is harmonized, right? And so we, we go from 50 different N95 masks to the two or three that most of the hospitals within the state um, have as their preferred N95 mask because there's fitting protocols and all this other stuff that the hospitals uh, go through and to try to switch it takes an act of God and just way too much work, right? And so you gotta get through this harmonization program uh, where, you're, where you're moving all that stuff out and properly managing the rotation um, to save everybody just a ton of money and, and heartache in the end. So just on the current environment, so we look at legislatively from a state and federal level what's happening with funding. So today we look at obviously from the COVID response from the CARE dollars, the CARE dollars were set to expire 1231 this year. Um, right now in the omnibus bill, they're looking and the, hopefully they will. The discussion is from all states are asking for an extension. The current extension periods they're looking at are from anywhere from six to nine months to 12 months. And hopefully the CARE dollars will be extended through December 31st into next year, allowing the states to utilize these as part of the mission for the COVID relief. Other things right now that are looking at this current legislation in Senate right now for state stockpiles. And there's a grant program in legislation right now that's part of the bill, and, and uh, I believe looks like it'll probably be part of this current bill and the omnibus bill, where they're having the states should build their own stockpiles and saying the federal stockpile is not all is required. So they're looking to the states to build their own stockpiles there's a discussion about a $10 billion grant program right now being put in place that the states would allow them to build a formulary, not just PPE, but pharmaceutical, DME, all, all the kind of mirror image what the federal stockpile looks like and build a facility out under the same level and standards of the federal stockpile. And there's a matching program where states would have a grant and over 10 year grant, there would be a certain match from the state levels. Right now, the current bill is looking like, I think for the first two, three years, the state would pay a dollar, the federal side would pay $9 and it rotates up and it's a 50-50 split at some point. So that's the current bills they're looking at right now uh, with the CARE dollars, and it might be a combination of both, but the, the federal side and the legislative side are realizing that states need to be prepared again, so we're not stuck here. So they're kind of establishing where the state should be developing their own internal stockpile at a state level that's almost mirror image to the federal stockpile. And that's our presentation for questions. Well, thanks guys. And first of all, let me apologize to Richard. I didn't introduce you um, because I thought you were following Steve and I, that was my mistake. And so Richard, Richard is the, the co-founder and chief executive officer. So now he's got a ton of experience, 25 years plus, 
in 20 in supply chain experience and was done a lot of things as you can hear by talking to him he was also in the navy and coast guard so thank you for your experience and so with that we want to get into some questions before you guys have to pop off and so um i would just say first of all one of our first questions is how many states is life science logistics assisting in the vaccine rollout um we're not directly in the vaccine rollout we're, we're helping states as far as advising them and consulting with them on that part we're in a lot of st different stockpiles right now so part of our initiative is some that we're being asked to deploy and develop stockpiles at a state level and so as part of that you know formulary we're looking to it'll have a cold chain storage for now and in the future as part of their future looking yeah but but to, to more directly answer that we are not our, our bread and butter is really the design and, and maintenance and implementation of, of stockpiles. Um, so the actual deployment of vaccines uh, and those programs, uh, we're not involved in. It. Most, uh, most of the states are managing that from a public health perspective. Okay. And I do have some vaccine questions on here too. So um, you want me to toss them to you and see what you Wait, can say? Right. Or? Yes, yeah. So please explain why the different vaccines should be stored differently. Is one more effective than the other? Uh, we know that they're stored at different temperatures, but we are concerned about the effectiveness of one over the other. Yeah, so I think Dr. Tilson kind of tried to answer this question. I, I like she, I, I'm unclear why the Pfizer vaccine is minus 70 and the Moderna minus minus 20. I mean, most vaccines that we typically see are either minus 20 uh, or two to eight. Um, but from all of the data that we've seen and that she talked about, I think efficacy is, is relatively similar and very high. Roger. And so how fragile is the vaccine? How quickly can it break down uh, if it's not kept at minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit? Any insight on that? Yeah, I think you can store it for up to a week at, at two to eight, um, but then it begins to break down after that. And that Pfizer shipper, uh, you're really only supposed to open that thing um, twice a day you know, at a minute of time. Yeah, twice a day for, for a minute. Um, there really should be a protocol developed, and I'm sure most of the public health folks are, are working on that protocol for how to manage that. You know, the other thing that we've seen out there there are um they look kind of like soft-sided lunch boxes if you will and they've got um they've got um you know a phase change material in there that keeps them cool you know there's either active or passive cooling units to store vaccines uh the one i'm describing is a passive unit and so what you need to do is you take the the inserts in this you know this basically this lunch box looking thing and you store it in a minus 20 environment um, for, for some period of time. And then you need to thaw it out in a two to eight environment for three hours. Um, and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be warmer than four and a half degrees C in order for it to completely thaw, otherwise it'll stay frozen. And so the reason that I'm bringing this up is because I'm sure a lot of folks are looking at these and it's important to manage you know, that three hour process, um, you know, diligently. Um, and so procedures should be created uh, to do that or the, the storage conditions won't be appropriate. And these vaccines um, to, you know, to, to the question are delicate. And, um, and we need to make sure that we're maintaining a proper storage environment. And so the reason I bring up those procedures and protocols around that is they will directly impact the vaccine's uh, efficacy if not followed properly. I, I would say one thing I add to as well, on building cold chain, it's gonna take a lot of time right now to build out larger cold chain facilities because there's so much need and requirements out there. I could recommend that people also look at sea containers. Uh, if sea containers are portable units. They can acquire yeah. a list of these and put these on site and they have the minus 70 and the minus 20s, and they have all the refrigeration requirements there and a portable unit on site there and secure them that way as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. It's a really, 
it's a really kind of quick to implement solution. There's lots of these C containers out there you can either lease or purchase. Um, they can, uh, you know, you can hardwire them in whatever facility that you're working out of. You can, you, you can keep them on a chassis uh, and let the onboard refrigeration units run on, on diesel. So it's a good kind of quick way to get some either two to eight or minus 20 storage capacity uh, up and running rather quickly. Thanks. It, the next item is, it's not so much of a question as it is just a, well, it's a question, but more of a rhetorical question. And so it's talking about, does, does anybody think that a state can maintain a stockpile over time that's not federally funded based on the financial pressures that states are in, not just now, but really on into the future? And, um, you know, I can say that here in North Carolina, we use, you know, CARES Act funding to help build up a stockpile um, along with some state appropriations too. But, you know, again, I think he brings up a good point that, you know, what does that look like for the future? And, um, yeah. And what are y'all's thoughts on that? If I may, you're you're correct on the care dollars. So, and I and I give a simple analogy. I try to tell people today we're we're all gonna. It's like today I want to go buy a swimming pool, but the problem is I received my water first, and the time I start digging the pool, the water dissolved already. That's the concept of having a facility versus having the product. So today I have all my product sitting here. I need to put it somewhere. I have an asset that I have a lot of money invested for. So when I'm taking my care dollars. If I was to utilize my CARES dollars, if you read the legislation, you could pay for a lot of this upfront utilizing CARES dollars today, a large portion of it, and it will normalize your out years going forward. As well as new legislation that's coming down the path right now, we talk about the grant dollars coming, they're looking at, it's not an appropriation, it's not the bill, but it looks like it's gonna be part of a bill that the federal government's realizing we need to have this. Once you develop your, your facility and your requirements and you have your formularies everything if you do it correctly and you do the proper rotation you have a facility that should maintain itself for a long period of time without expiring truthfully we've seen a lot of facilities we've seen states that had to throw out tens and tens of millions of dollars of, of product because they weren't maintained properly and they passed their expiration date and they were never rotated out if you develop the proper rotation program you have an evergreen life and then maintaining facility, initial cost of building a facility and maintaining is key. And you can do that through your federal funding and your grants right now. And then you have something to protect yourself. When that balloon goes up, the state's ready, the mission critical, mission ready. Yeah, we, we, do, we do think there's a way to, to, do this, to do this well, given the current funding constraints, right? And to Steve's point, look, there's three basic costs, right? You've got a facility cost, you've got a labor cost, and you've got a materials cost. Right, and so facility uh, and materials you can certainly handle up front with cares, and then it's you know how do you manage the labor piece of it moving forward? But I think there's ways to do it. Right, and and just as a an aside, I would say that I hope the feds are looking at that too for their federal stockpile because again in North Carolina we were delivered stuff that was like a N95s that when you put them on, they were just rotten, fell right off your face. So yeah. it's, it's a good lesson learned for everybody, I think. Well, I, so think, next, I, think, go ahead. I think people learned a lot from this and, and hopefully we don't do it over again and we're prepared for the future here. And we can be, there's systems in place and yeah. processes in place, we can do it. Right, and I will also add this, is that as an emergency management director, I feel like, I should have been better prepared in our pandemic planning. We had a good pandemic plan. We've been through H1N1. Of course, that was nothing like this, but uh, in no way, shape or form did we have a, a state stockpile for PPE. We didn't. And what we always preach is being able to hold the fort until the feds can get here. And so we, we really did not do that in this case, at least here in North Carolina. Um, okay. All right, so next question, as a federal uniform model for future state stockpile facility, a good idea for scalability and implementation? 
So I think we can all agree that states need a stockpile capability, right? Right. Uh, so the federal government needs a stockpile capability, obviously. The states need a, state pot, a stockpile capability. And I use the term capability in, intentionally, right? Because it needs to be flexible. It needs to be able to adapt. And, and to your point, H1N1 was nothing like COVID, right? Mm -hmm. So the right. infrastructure that we build out needs to be flexible. The other thing that I will add to that is, you know, this whole thing around technology and communication is so critical because it's very difficult to respond um, nationally if the states have their own set of, of data and information, the federal government has another set of data and information, and there's no real interoperability or reporting at a macro level to really gauge you know, effectiveness across the nation in terms of what we have on hand and who's depleting what amount of inventory and where the needs are. And so as we begin to theorize about what this really should look like in the future and how to make it happen, I think that those three things need to take place, right? So the states all need to have a capability. The federal government obviously needs a capability, but as importantly, the technology needs to exist where everybody gets visibility, you know, kind of globally, if you will. Roger. So um, next question is on the stockpile grant program. Do we think tribal governments would be included with states? And, and I, you know, in our state, you know, we, we tend to give our tribe their, the choice. They want to go straight to the feds or they can go through us. And I think that Probably other states do the same thing. Um, maybe I, I, not, but. I would agree with that. I would probably say it exactly. That's exactly what would happen. Okay. They, try, they have their own funding. Right. So, so how is tribals are not tribals aren't included yet in this number, by the way. Okay. Thanks. How is cost captured with stockpile rotation? State might pay four dollars and ten cent per mask in bulk, but private sector pays six dollars and fifty cents. Okay, so again, so the state stockpile program. Let's assume a rotation program happens. It's not about price points. It's about at time of need. So you have to look at an inventory. This so the current stockpile is set to expire, and you do a private. A program with a state facility, they would order their products. It matched up to the existing product in the state stockpile. You would send that product out while their product is shipped directly in through wherever products they're buying it from, but they have to ma match to the same SKUs or similar acceptance. Their product would come in and you'd rotate the older product out that still had a shelf life for a year or two back into the public or private sector. That allows the full rotation and it satisfies the needs of the stockpile it satisfies the needs of the participating partner because then that participating partner if something happens again a pandemic happens they can share as part of the state stockpile allow them to participate in purchasing through their vehicle through the state stockpile without having surge pricing and capabilities to have the product when they need it now a lot of states now some states are making it mandatory under current statutes where state hospital well, hospitals nursing homes need to have their own supply there's the other logistics side, and we deal with a lot of hospital groups and major groups as well, that their requirements are, what do I do with this now? I have to store this stuff. The other thing we're going to learn about this post-pandemic is we have a lot of equipment. We're going to have a lot of hospital beds. You're going to have a lot of ventilators. You're going to have a lot of x-ray machines. These are major assets. I, I kind of can define it as an asset management capability. We need to ensure we keep these in a facility to maintain these assets, but when we do need them in the future, but not just throw them away. So it's all important how they're being maintained and controlled and maintenance during that process. All right. Well, gentlemen, I think that's about all the time that we have for today. And I wanna thank uh, Mr. Solomon, Mr. Beanie for sharing their insights with us. Uh, it's obvious that you guys are, are deep into the trenches just like we are, and we certainly appreciate it. I also wanna thank um, all of the attendees as well, there were close to 200 today, but I especially want to thank uh, Karen Langdon, our, our organizer, and uh, Anita Woods, uh, who is our tech expert to help us out there, 
And uh, ladies, we appreciate all the great work that you have done. And so again, appreciate the great work done by everybody. I just wanna say uh, one thing, I'll leave you with this. You know, even though we have the vaccine, we still have a long ways to go. Um, we got to focus on the three W's and prevention. Um, we know that the vaccine could be derailed if there's a disruption in our logistics operation, or if we continue to have such severe results uh, with the pandemic, with the amount of people that are coming up hot and being hospitalized, or if we have vaccine hesitancy among our population. So remember prevention, 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 get that outreach out there for vaccines and, and stay focused on uh, pushing that vaccine out. With that, I'll turn it back over to Karen to close us out. Ma'am, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate it. Dr. Tilson, Steve, Rich, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today, and thank you to our great audience for participating. For more information on NEMA, please visit our website, www.nemaweb.org. Take care, uh, stay well, have a lovely holiday, and uh, have a productive rest of your day. Thank you so much.